I'm Celia Keenan Bolger, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Greetings, extraterrestrials. <laughs> it is I, Anne, of Damien and Anne, back here with another episode of You Might Know Her From. Hey, folks, it is me, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Welcome to our little show. If you haven't listened before, what is this, Anne? This is our podcast. We talk to each other about pop culture things, our own pop culture musings, what we're watching, what we're reading, what we care about, what we hate. And then we get to interview an actress each episode. The The rule of thumb here is never men. We're not going to talk to cis men. We're going to talk to women and non-binary folk about their career and the ups and downs of the industry. So this is our passion project. This is what we do. We're in season four. We're in mid-swing right now. And we are excited. I'm really excited, honestly, about something that was announced, I don't know, maybe last week or the week prior, which is that, you know how much we loved the real world homecoming? Oh, yes, and yes, I yes. loved it back to New York or whatever they were calling it. I loved it so much. I thought it was one of the best things I had watched on television in the last year. And I, I just saw like a little teaser trailer for the new one, which they're reuniting the cast of L.A., which I was hopeful that they were going to do. But I had some doubts that maybe they would because it seems like it was not like the, one of the most iconic seasons. Like I think people skip over L.A. They think it goes right to San Francisco because there was like Puck and Pedro. Totally. But L.A. was formative for me personally. Absolutely. I remember being at the beach in a beach house with my family. My older sister was watching it. I was probably in second grade and I was obsessed with it. I was obsessed with Tammy Roman. She got an abortion on camera. She got her mouth wide. She had her jaw she had her, wired shut. Yeah, her mouth was wired shut. She wanted tacos. Then the blanket got pulled off her, and it wasn't not funny. And David got kicked out of the house. And then they got Glenn. Then Irene yep. got married. She was a cop. And then lesbian she Beth left. moved in. I mean, it was just like, yep. it was to me, it is iconic. But here's a hot take for you, Anne. So Tell this me. new cast, it's like they are reuniting the seven roommates. But they're not, it's not like, because that cast had nine people, right? Because they replaced mm -hmm. both David and Irene. Right. Gay Beth and Glenn are both part of the reunion. But Dominic, who was like the Irish punk rocker, right? And yeah, then yeah, Aaron, yeah. who was like the blonde surfer boy turned like accountant. They're not in the press photos. And like in, I read like a deadline thing that said they would not be a part of it. And, but, like, according to their LinkedIn, they, this is where they both work now. And I was like, what? Like, wait, where, where they work where? One of them works in the music department, I think, like, for Disney or something. I think that's Dominic. And then I think that Aaron is, like, works in some, like, investment banking or is an entrepreneur in, like, somewhere. I find that irritating. It makes sense to me that Dominic wouldn't show up because, to me, I don't like the idea that he's working in corporate, first yeah, of all. Yeah, because he's, like, counterculture. I'm not into that. It makes sense to me that he wouldn't show up because I, mean, I was like, maybe he's still gigging in Ireland. I'm into that. Aaron seems like he's one of those people that you would have gone to high school with that was like hot in high school and then would age terribly by age, like 29. He would be like hideous and bald by 29. And I think that's where he's at. So let's hope that that's the reason that he doesn't want to come back. But like if he's working in investment banking, it seems like he probably would want to. I would like if just at minimum for them to show them. Like I can't, because you can't erase them from the reunion. And here's another concern. This is a hot take. Right, like Glenn was like a non-starter. Like he really brought nothing to the table. Yeah, to me, he's sort of like the poor man and Andre from season Andre, one. Andre, yeah. exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And Beth, too, I was very into. I think she brought something different to the table. And to me, her outfit, that that T-shirt that she wore, I'm not gay, but my girlfriend is while she was shooting pool on the second floor of the house, <laughs> is iconic lesbian fashion from the 90s. Yes, I totally agree. So I'm excited to see where she's at. Also, just like Beth, one is so special she is a legend in the universe of real world road rules, the challenge, the gauntlet, like all, like she is still such a force. So I'm excited to see how she tries to like produce the reunion when she's at it. Cause she's like the reality star. Well, I mean, actually Tammy Roman is. Yeah. Tammy Roman, yeah. Nay, Anderson, Nay, like, Tammy Akbar. Roman took a step up in the reality universe. You know what I mean? And she also has an acting career. So I feel like Tammy Roman is in a different category than Beth one who has like lived. Look, she's made a living working in the real world universe. So more power to her, but I can't wait to see how it plays out. Can I say though, that here's my hot take is that I'm a little concerned because Beth Wan and Tammy are so 
well versed at reality TV that I think that some of the beauty of Homecoming was that like Julie totally. and Heather B and sicko Becky Kevin like they and Becky for sure were not good like they weren't like reality TV producers slash performers Correct. so I think that some of the like magic was one the alchemy of like them being this group of the originals but also that none of them were like knew what was going to be and like Becky was unraveling when she realized that she was going to become this like quote yeah. unquote like the Karen right. of the house in yeah. this reunion yeah. and I wonder like now it's like Tammy and Beth know how to do the thing you know right right I know I think it's gonna be much less satisfying but I am still excited and also I feel like John is gonna be like the wild card like is John gonna be the Julie is he gonna be like has he learned things has he grown or is he the same old same is this a hot take I hate John (laughs) no it's not it's like the most it's the most expected thing I could get from you is that you hate him it's like I could have guessed it he's too earnest for me but maybe I'll make I also like but his line reading of true story is I Iconic. Iconic. <laughs> True story. So good. Also, you know what? Something else that we haven't talked about that I've been wanting to talk about that you actually sent me and then we never discussed it, which was that Justin Bieber released a new music video. <laughs> oh my God. It's like the world moves so fast and yet so slow. I got a text message from Naomi, who's, whose friend Marissa, who is a mutual friend, but maybe doesn't have my cell phone number, was like, please make sure Anne knows that this is happening. And I didn't. She was like 30 minutes ahead of the curve, like before it had hit deadline. It like had gone live. So I appreciated Marissa by way of Naomi letting me know. And of course, I let you know as soon as I heard it. It was one of the wildest things I've ever seen. It's like the story of Diane Keaton as Justin Bieber's mom in this by the way the song is horrible one of the worst songs I've ever heard I don't even know what it's called it's horrendous and she plays his mom and then the dad dies and so it's about her like grieving the loss them both grieving the loss of like their husband and father I mean I thought she was a ghost no no the husband is the ghost and then Justin Bieber there's a scene did you watch it yeah but I just like saw her dancing in a bar no 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 you didn't watch it you didn't watch it you watched a clip from Instagram yeah yeah, yeah that's what there I did I watched whole, the clip in Inst- from Instagram there's a whole video there's a whole storyline that you gotta watch the whole thing because at a certain point, Justin Bieber, after they have like a glass of wine and after they're in, out of the mourning period at the funeral, they come back and he's helping her swipe through on social media, like men of a certain age. And at the end of the music video, they swear to God, dump the dead dad husband's ashes in the ocean. They turn around from having this very cathartic moment of healing. And there is a hot white headed man with a Jeep sitting at the beach and it was clear that Justin Bieber had arranged for this new man that she had met online to meet them and take her out on the town and she leaves with him and it's like is this how you want to end the scene of you throwing your dad's ashes into the ocean is with like your pawning your Diane mother Keaton off onto mother, a new, like getting a new into lover. a jeep with some rich white guy with white hair i couldn't believe it happened why why do you think Diane did it Oh, I think that Diane's very into being, like, you know, hip. You know, she, like, wore gloves to go see Miley Cyrus in concert with Sarah Paulson. Like, she wants to be in the mix. She, I think, had a thing about Justin Bieber years ago on Ellen. And, like, Ellen did a whole thing about how she loved Justin Bieber. And I thought, this is is rough. And I don't know what it's about. I have a love-hate relationship with Diane Keaton, as we all probably know at this point. I had a hard time watching her nervous energy as a young person. Like, I didn't find it appealing. Like, her sort of, like, hysterical, neurotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that was, like, like her her character bits. Yeah. I sort of have more love for it now than I used to. I mean, like, because I love her Nancy Myers films, obviously. Of course. Something's Gotta Give is uh, incredible. Incredible. But, like, I wish that it wasn't Justin Bieber for some reason. And I have to say, I think she's quite good in many things. She was not good in this. She was her acting was actively bad in it. It's very stilted. It's very uncomfortable. I can't wait to talk to her about it one day. Yeah, I. I she's a fascinating study. She's got a book about clowns. She collects. <laughs> she loves horses and clowns, and apparently Justin Bieber. Here's the thing: Justin Bieber is now a man, which is shocking. But in this music video, we had to watch him like play a young person again or something, you know, with his mother. But this week's guest, how about that for a transition, is known for playing extremely young people, which is the exact opposite when we get into this, the exact opposite of what Damien and I experienced <laughs> throughout our theatrical careers. Totally. Our guest this week, Celia Keenan Bolger, is just a revelation we were so excited to talk to her about her entire career which as we said spans like playing teenagers very well into adulthood 
Yeah, it was a total pleasure to get to talk to Celia Kina Bolger about her like entire oeuvre, which is like a 20 plus years in New York theater, but then also some really wonderful film and TV credits, including Diane, which we both just were totally ob- obsessed with. And if you know that, you know that because you heard our interviews with Mary Kate Place and Joyce Van Patten, but like it was just great to have yet another one of the great um, women from the ensemble of Diane on the show. When we spoke to her, she hadn't yet gone back into To Kill a Mockingbird, which has now reopened on Broadway with Jeff Daniels. So you can get your tickets now. She has, of course, won a Tony for playing Scout. And it was great to hear about sort of winning the Tony, the COVID period, all of the uprising and protest related to George Floyd, and what it looks like to come back into the New York theater in this new moment in fall 2021. We loved talking with her. You might know her from Diane and Broadway productions of To Kill a Mockingbird, The Glass Menagerie, Peter and the Starcatcher, and the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. What a day. We are truly delighted to be here with none other than Tony winning actor Celia Keenan Bolger. Celia, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, we're going to dive in from a strange angle here. You, of course, have a 20-plus year career in the New York theater, and we'll get to that, I promise. But we have Mm -hmm. to ask you about one of our favorite movies, and that is Diane, a film that we lauded ad infinitum on this podcast. We talked to Mary Kay Place about it, and what a pleasure it was to see you pop up in that 2018 movie opposite Jake Lacey and, of course, Mary Kay Place. We think this is an underrated treasure of a film that everyone should see, so can you tell us how that movie came to you? and what your experience was on that set. Oh my gosh, you guys, really good start. (laughs) I think that movie, and I, you know, sometimes when you're making something on set, you're like, I don't know if this is any good. But that movie, I think because of Mary Kay Place, and I have sort of worshipped at the altar of Mary Kay Place for (laughs) many, many years. And it was like, also as an actor, you get scripts and you're always like, I'm not good when I'm reading a script to be like, this is really Right. Or like, but when you see people attached that are people that you admire, I was like, if she's in, I would love to try to be in this movie. And so, you know, I do remember for the audition, like wearing a turtleneck and like a cross. I like was like, went out and bought a cross necklace because I play <laughs> this wife of Jake Lacey after he has sort of gone through a like a born again experience. But, you know, I hadn't done that much TV and film up to that point. And I had done like littler parts on movies. But this one, I remember feeling like I was in such good learning territory. Like when you haven't been on that many sets, just watching how people work and the different ways that people work. And both Jake and Mary Kay Place, I thought they were so easy. Like they, neither of them was sweating anything. But they were like so, it sounds sort of cliched, but just like dropped in. Like I was like, they're they're just doing, they're sitting around this table and just like going with it. And then I saw the final product and I was extremely moved by that movie, guys. I also think like that number of extraordinary women over 50 in a movie, I was like, more of that. Yes. Yeah, like in what movie... Joyce Van Patten, Andrea Martin, <laughs> Phyllis Summerville, Didi O'Connell. I, yes, it, Phyllis. Phyllis and I were Estelle Parsons. Mockingbird. Yes, exactly. Like that's a, an embarrassment of riches. Yeah. Really. And with like fully fleshed out characters, they weren't just playing old ladies. Absolutely. Damien and I talk about that film all the time, and I still, I said to Damien today, I can't believe that movie was made by a man. Kent Jones is just like, I I will see whatever he does. I really recommend if you haven't seen it. Celia is so good in it. It takes so many turns and is so beautiful. Go see Diane. Mm. Thanks for that plug, guys. It makes me want to go watch it again. It's streaming on Hulu right now, which I was like so pleased to discover that it was still streaming. I was like, thank God. <laughs> right, Yes. Okay, so Celia, you earned a Tony win in 2019 for your performance as Scout in Aaron Sorkin's Broadway adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird. And in our research for today, I read that they had originally planned to actually cast children in the lead roles, but they asked you to participate in a reading of Sorkin's first draft. And then that turned into them sort of saying like, hey, maybe we could use adults to narrate this as the children. So can you talk to us and tell our listeners like a little bit about that process and whether it was daunting for you to sort of take on this iconic role in an American classic in such a high-profile production with, like, all of these very big names? 
I mean, that first reading, like when I got the call, I had worked with Bart Shear on two other projects. And so he said, look, you know, we're doing this new version of To Kill a Mockingbird. Obviously, no, it was my agent was the one that told me. She was like, they, you will never have this part. But they understand that Aaron needs to hear the script out loud. And obviously, the language is dense. And they're worried that a 10-year-old is just not going to be able to give him an understanding of the first like pass. So I think I went in feeling so lucky that I was like, maybe I'll get like some other job with Aaron Sorkin or like some one of these people in this room with zero stakes. Like I didn't have the thing that I think so often when you do readings that you're like, is this like, is this job maybe mine someday? Or is this, am I a placeholder for someone who already has this job? Like, so I think initially I was just like, I'm just going to do this. And I talked a little bit about how meaningful that book was to me growing up, like my family was not particularly religious, but I do feel like that book more than any other like religious text was referred to as like a moral compass for how our family functioned and the way that we treated other people. And so it, it loomed large in my childhood. So I also was just like, and I used a monologue from the book for the first play I ever auditioned for because they were like, you have to do a monologue. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, you know, who has good things to say is Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird. So we like went through the novel and I like highlighted Mr. Cunningham's that scene when she goes and confronts Mr. Cunningham at the jail. So I even had, you know, it's like a funny, long sort of a history that I feel with that that show. And then once they said, you know, it was like during that reading, they were like, you know, maybe this actually would work with adults that reflecting on this time. And it, that was more stressful, where I just suddenly was like, oh, don't let me ruin this now that I've like opened a door. And then the working on it, I think actors approach I feel like sometimes when I do master classes or if I'm teaching, they're like, you know, how do you prepare for a role? And it's always so different for me. It like really depends on what it is. And for this one, I felt like because so many people know that book, I was like, well, I have to know a lot more about that book and a lot more about Harper Lee than most mm -hmm. of the people coming in. And so it felt... Like I was able to have this whole experience. I went down to Macom, Alabama. I, you know, went all through her town. I did all of this research on Harper Lee. And I think because of that, it helped me go into the process feeling less intimidated by the sort of enormity of taking on like the most beloved heroine in American literature. And and that I also felt like that rehearsal process. And those boys that I did the show with, Gideon Glick and Will Pullen, that the way we were able to ask questions, and I think probably because we were grownups, like the idea that they would find a young person who would be as good as Mary Bottom was in that movie, I'm like, good luck. And that because I was an adult, I didn't feel all of the comparisons. I mean, if anything, I think most people were like, you have a grown-up playing the role of Scout Finch. Like, what have you done to our beloved To Kill a Mockingbird? So, you know, I think that was ultimately, that helped a lot, sort of feeling like I had more context going into the rehearsal process than just this book that we all really cared about. Um, and, and the truth is, like, I have really big feelings about what it's going to be like to go back into it post-George Floyd. I mean, I think the play is going to be t very, very different. Like it's going to resonate differently and that we have a real responsibility. I'm so glad that we have a month to go back in and rehearse again because there's been so many rocks that have been turned over in this past year. And I think we want to make sure that especially a play that is about race in America on Broadway is keeping up with what we've uncovered. So I have to imagine, speaking of audience reactions, you had a lot of kids coming in for school trips since To Kill a Mockingbird is such a classic. Can you talk about any of the sort of reactions, like the funniest, the harshest, the most critical <laughs> reaction you got from a kid? I mean, so we had you know, the school audiences I always found unbelievably moving because there would come a point in the trial of Tom Robinson where 
people, lawyers had been talking and talking and talking. And I was like, we've lost them. We've lost the children. They don't care about all this talking. And we would get to something. And that in that way that only student audiences can do, they would go, oh, or like there would just be this huge resonant response where I was like, oh, my God, they actually are listening. And I remember we saw we did a show one time when I go upstairs, it's at the very end of the play and the door opens and throughout the audience, all of them were like, that's Boo Radley, it's Boo Radley, that, that's Boo Radley. And I was like, <laughs> they they know this book well enough to know and and they've been listening well enough to like be this invested in this little girl's moment of seeing this ghost of a person in her, you know, in her world. And then like this random evening, I remember there was like this 10 year old little boy who was sitting in the front row and, you know, we have this part where the kids narrate like all of the 12 jurors say guilty. And he totally lost it. Like he just burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And I was like, he's like, it was so moving (laughs) to me. It makes me want to cry just talking about it. But that I was like, this child, like, has is invested enough in this play and understands justice enough at the age that he is and i i just hope and wonder what it means in the way that theater like really transformed me as a kid i think like watching theater had a, a, an actual effect on the way that i looked at the world that i was like maybe that kid just had a little moment of that in a Broadway show, like getting to watch Injustice <laughs> on that stage and, yeah. and have like a full on emotional response to it. We mentioned Phyllis Somerville earlier, who was in Diane, but she also, of course, was Mrs. DuBose in Mockingbird yes. with you. And we lost her, sadly, in 2020. Do you have any good stories about her? Like, Oh, my gosh. Phyllis was such a... You know, I think she was really the last of a generation that really came up. And, you know, she had amazing television and film credits, but she built a career in the theater. And it was so apparent in her work ethic, in the way that she, in her her sense of fun and joy, like her laugh. And she was also, you know, she's such a hard ass in so many of the roles that she plays like my four-year-old he was four at the time came in and was watching a rehearsal at the Schubert theater and it was the scene with Mrs. DuBose and when it was done I was like what did you think about that lady that racist old lady and he was like I like her voice and I was like yeah you and me both you and everybody Phyllis Somerville had like such a distinctive quality to you know the way that she spoke but she was just what I what I was going to say is that she had this like hard as rocks exterior and she was so beautifully sensitive on the inside, which is something that I feel like you wouldn't necessarily know from seeing her on stage because she was such a battle axe. And we would take the train home together and she would always say, Celia, where did you get that? Where did you get those pants or where did you get that dress? And she's like, I'm going to check that out. And that always I was like... <laughs> sweet like she was just she was really curious one of the great gifts of of working with older actors and I felt I feel this way about Dakin Matthews who played the judge is that you watch what it means to be this great mind and continue to be in the theater and and you know I think for Phyllis there were times where she would you know we would be rehearsing she was like I can't remember the goddamn line and I was like Phyllis it's fine like, it's so fine, but, like, what it means to have done it for as long as she did and then feel like I don't have all of my faculties or all of the ways that I used to just be able to do this work, but and yet still show up with such a sense of curiosity and and joy, and I feel so lucky to have had that time with her. And, you know, she did the show for a year. She barely missed. She was so badass in so so many ways 
that was one of those, th that was like one of the parts of last year that was actually like as painful as it was beautiful because our cast got together on a Zoom and we all just sort of shared stories about her. And it was the first time that we had all kind of connected during the pandemic. And so she gave us this gift of like coming together and being with one another and sharing stories about an experience and talking about her. I just wish she could have been there to hear all of us talk about her because I think it would have made her feel really good. And I don't know that we said it enough at the time. As we mentioned, you know, at the time of this recording, it's been announced that you're going back into the show starting in October. So what does it mean to you to be able to sort of reopen a Broadway show in this historic moment after, you know, the year that we've had as the community tries to sort of rebuild and reinvigorate? You know, I have had mixed feelings about it for a while. I think the thing that I really had to come face to face with this past year is that this community that I have been a part of for 20 years that has given me such enormous purpose and belonging and community and and was a place that I could mostly look to not only to feel good about myself but to feel like myself like I think being an actor being a New York actor has helped me grow into the kind of person that I want to be and that I had to come face to face with the fact that that was not the experience for almost anyone who is black or brown in our community. And so what does it mean for me to have had this unbelievable time when a huge portion of, the, of this community that I value so much not only doesn't feel that way, but in fact feels traumatized, feels harm, feels like there is so much repair that has to be done. And so in my mind, the reopening of Broadway, I was like, good luck. I'll see you in five years. I can't <laughs> wait to come back when it's all got its shit together. And I was like, I'm going to wait for that work to be done. I'm going to step aside and that will be great. And then everything happened with the Scott Rudin situation, which felt in its own way sort of extremely complicated and somewhat traumatic just in learning things and also having been a part of his show. And when it when we found out that To Kill a Mockingbird was being taken over by a new producer, he got in touch and said, you know, would you ever consider coming back? And then I had to just really have a big sit with myself to be like... And also, the you know, I feel like when I tell people now who... We're like, I'm like, so my guys, I went to the dentist today and I told her that I was going back into the Kill a Mockingbird and she looked at me like, you have got to be kidding me because I was in so much. That time in my life was unbelievably stressful. And I think because of the rigors of what the, the job itself is, it's a three hour play where I basically never leave the stage. It was my first job that I had had for that amount of time, having had a young child. And there's just so, there was a really horrible incident at the end, like in August, we finished in November, where they thought that there was a, a mass shooting in Times Square when it was just a, a motorcycle that backfired. But people freaked out and ran into our theater screaming mm. that like fearing for their lives. And so there was this huge mass sort of, it, people tried to get out of the theater and I was on stage like right out front and it was it was totally traumatizing oh and so I left that show with all kinds of like really intense exhaustion and and trauma and so when they said you know would you be willing to come back I thought you know there are so few times in our lives when something has been broken that we get to go back and try to like write the final chapter of it. Like that just doesn't really happen. And I thought, you know, both in the racial justice part of what we have come to face in our community, maybe I could be part of facilitating some of the repair and preemptively making sure that that kind of harm doesn't occur again, at least in this little corner of my community. And I might be able to try to do it better, like try it again and have more compassion, I think, with myself than I did the first time around, 
rest more, like all of these, it's interesting, like the, <laughs> the things that we maybe learned from this past year about this sort of toxic productivity and the the scarcity mindset and just like this like obsessiveness with with being busy that I wonder if I might be able to go back and do it better, not just for myself, but try to create a better work environment for the people mm. around me. So I was like, you know, I think I actually, I think I, I could get interested in that. And I will also say like Jeff Daniels basically said, he was like, I won't go back if you won't go back. So make them give you everything that you want. And that was also like a real, I think a real moment of allyship where he mm -hmm. like, yeah. He was able to reach out to me and then I was like, I will do that. I will keep, keep passing that on. Like we will keep making sure that this space is, is better for all of us. So I also don't think I would be there had he not insisted on it. Celia, even when we were kids, Damien and I were cast as the old people in plays <laughs> and musicals. Okay, this has always been true. Damien was a Horace Vandergelder. I was the bird lady in Mary Poppins. This is sure, who we sure, sure. were seen as. And I was Michael Banks. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, you know, what's interesting about the trajectory of your career is you've been tasked with playing kids and teenagers for much of the Broadway portion of your career, from Spelling Bee to Save to Peter and the Starcatcher to Mockingbird. You even played Laura Wingfield very convincingly at 35. So... Can you talk about sort of what is the hardest part of being an adult actor with like adult desires and adult needs who is being asked to play a child? Is it the physicality? Is it the voice? Is it the mentality? Can you speak to that at all? You know, I think as I get older, it is the, <laughs> the physicality. I'm like, guys, I got to do a play with a couch. Like, can I be <laughs> that, like, who was the mom in August Osage County? Didn't she like lie in a bed the whole time? I was like, I got to get one of those roles. Yeah, yeah. Because that is as I get older. And, you know, I'm like thinking about it a little bit now where I'm just like, oh, my God, my stamina. I'm going to really have to work on my stamina before I go back into that show. And I felt it during Peter and the Starcatcher, too, that when you're playing somebody who's young, at least the characters that I've played. And maybe it's my own fault because I'm like, and then we could run across the stage at this point. And you're like, just remember, you're going to do that eight times a week. <laughs> there does come a point where you're just like, if you don't have all the energy, it can take a toll. And I think that's like one of those interesting things about aging that I think you don't necessarily recognize until <laughs> you're like a little bit too far in and you're like, my body doesn't really want to do this that much anymore. Mm. And I should have thought about that before. And so it's like my job to advocate for myself, even when I feel like I do have the energy, but like maybe on like a Saturday afternoon, three months into the run, I'm going to be like, I don't feel like doing that. I feel tired. And, you know, plays so often, this isn't totally fair. I mean, I think the great leading ladies of Broadway who are like triple threats like they are doing all the things they're the amount of energy that they are expending is so much but when I think about like the great leads of plays usually the physicality is not so insane it's that you know there's like a real emotional core to what they have to do or there is you know sometimes it is it can be very physical but that I think when you're playing somebody young you have to be super in touch with the highs and lows of what younger people generally experience, which are bigger swings usually than grownups, your physicality has to be like super on. And I do think <laughs> the ones that I played like to talk a lot. And so you just have to be like ready for your voice to be in pretty decent shape. You know, I, I've gone through so many different times in my life where I've been like, no more kids. I, ref I do not want to play any more kids. And then I don't work, guys. Then I can't get a job. And so I'm like, guys, I'll go back to playing kids. I'll go back to playing kids. Can you expound on that? Like any conversations maybe? Like when you were at some sort of crossroads in your career, whether it was internally or whether it was with your partner or your team that you were like, I'm not taking, like I'm not going to play another teenager. Like, ne like I need to start transitioning into different roles. Yeah. I mean, I think after Saved, because I had done Spelling Bee and then I did Saved and I was like, you know... I don't want to be known as the grown-up who plays kids in shows. Guys, that's my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a Tony. I mean, literally, you know, it's okay. But I do think after that experience, this director, Trip Coleman, saw me in Saved. And he was like, have you ever been in a play? And I was like, no. 
I would love to be in a play. I mean, I had done plays in college, but I could not get arrested to be in a play in New York. And he was like, you should be in a play. I was like, well, Trip, I can think of somebody who could maybe make that happen. And he was like, right, right, right. And then he called me in for this second stage show written by Leslie Hedlund called Bachelorette that was this unbelievable play where I got to play something and someone who doesn't even exist in a musical. And I think that for me was like, wait a minute, there's a whole new world out there. And so I think now, as long as I'm like sprinkling in enough grown up time, if my lot in life is to play more kids on Broadway, I think I'm probably here for it. Like it's gonna have to be something that I feel pretty strongly about. But I think as long as there is some balance and you know, no one is ever gonna cast me as anything younger than like 39 on television. So I don't have to worry about that. Celia, during lockdown, you started a podcast called Sunday Pancakes where you interview an actor each episode and lead a very candid conversation on what keeps them feeling connected, motivated, and like curious about the world around them. We are big fans of it, and like you have such an easy gift for conversation. But assuming that this sort of originated as like a pandemic project, do you think you're going to continue like this endeavor once the theater reopens? I don't know if you guys feel this way. Like, there is something interesting about starting something where your taste or your talent has not caught up to your taste. That when you do something new, that I was like, I'm very used to going into new spaces and being like pretty good at this. I'm pretty, I know what I'm doing in the rehearsal room. I know what I'm doing behind a camera. And with podcasting, I was like, I literally have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to edit. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to prepare. And to some degree being like, well, I'm just going to trust that I've been on the planet long enough that I'm not going to make a total asshole of myself. But that I think ultimately it was a really, it was good for my brain to try to figure out the puzzle of that. I would want to keep doing it because I want to keep getting better at it. That that there is now that I've like scratched that itch a little bit. I'm like, what would it look like to do the next season? What would I what would I bring to the table that I couldn't have known this first time around? One of my favorite episodes of Sunday Pancakes is the conversation you had with your friend and fellow Tony winner Kelly O'Hara. So for the background on this, for listeners, if you don't know, is you originated the role of Clara in The Light in the Piazza, performing the role first in Seattle and Chicago. But then when it moved to Broadway in 2003, the producers recast the role with Kelly O'Hara, who had previously been in the ensemble of the show. So you two had a very frank conversation on the show some 18 years later about the sort of paths that that show led you both on your friendship and the heartbreak of this industry. Can you say that like when you started the podcast, did you know you wanted to hash out this particular conversation? And if so, did it take any convincing on Kelly's part? When I was putting together my dream list, I knew that I wanted to talk to her. And I think I knew that I wanted to talk about our experiences inside of what that was. She had emailed me sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, we were just sort of going back and forth, texting each other and, you know, being in touch and saying, how are you doing? And she said, I think, like, could we someday sit down and have a talk? And I don't know if I knew that she wanted to talk about Piazza exactly, but I was like, I couldn't tell if she wanted like a big catch up or whatever. But when I, you know, as I was preparing for the episode, I have always thought this, that It's like in a breakup, like the person who does the breaking up never gets as much love from everybody because they're like, well, it was your decision. So what are you so sad about? And you're like, both people in the breakup, if there was a lot of love there, both people get to be really, really sad. And for me, it always felt like Kelly was the one that was like, well, it all worked out. So she she doesn't get to say anything about the experience. Whereas I've been able to go around and be like, it was a very, it was a defining moment in my career. It was very difficult. I learned so much. I understood so much more about myself. Like, you know, I'm able to reference it as this great teaching moment. She is not really allowed to talk about it or didn't feel comfortable talking about it because she was just like, what do I get to say? That it was hard? That I don't get to say that because I got the part. And I wanted to be able to tell her that I knew that that was true. And I wanted her to be able to say her piece about it. And I think like 
the conversation that we ended up having is it's so crazy to me that it happened <laughs> publicly. And I'm also so grateful that it happened publicly that she was willing to sort of go there and be as honest as she was. But the thing that if I never do Sunday pancakes again, I will say like, I got my friendship with Kelly O'Hara back because of that podcast. Like that to me, I can't, if that is the only purpose that it served, like I'll take it. Highly recommend. Okay, Celia, we've reached the part of the show that we like to call the rapid fire. It's rapid for us. You can take as much time as you need. It just allows right. us to have non sequiturs. Great, 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 great. Okay, Celia Keenan Bolger, what, if any, is your connection to the Ray Bolger estate? These are the good questions. No idea. Maybe look into it someday. There might be something there. I'm not sure. <laughs> he was a wonderful song and dance man. There must be some lineage connecting us. Okay, Celia, your siblings are both in the biz, Andrew and Maggie Keenan Bolger, and both are openly queer. Do you ever feel left out? Yes. <laughs> it's one of the best things. We I, we were just having this conversation where it was like some Christmas, and my sister had gotten her nose pierced, and my brother had gotten his eyebrow pierced. And I, my brother had not really come out, though we knew he was gay. And I was like, isn't it crazy that I'm the only Keenan Bolger who doesn't have a piercing on my face and who's straight? <laughs> And they were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I do feel like there are, I mean, I think in so many ways, like I'm such a better ally because they are both so in touch with not just the culture, but trying to push the envelope and be better queers. And that's really helpful for me. We love the work of the aforementioned Leslie Headland, And in 2010, as you said, you start off Broadway in her play Bachelorette, which was then turned in the 2012 film starring Kirsten Dunst and Lizzie Kaplan. Your character is fucked up for much of the show. <laughs> Can you tell us any hacks as an actor for how to convincingly play fucked up? Oh, my gosh. We snorted so much powdered vitamin D. That That's I think... what it is? Yes. Oh, is that what they my... used in films and TV? Do you know as I well? I wonder. We but asked an like... actor once and they could not remember what it was. <laughs> well, I mean, that checks out too. <laughs> but I think there is something to... I had never snorted anything up my nose until that point. And there is something about just... It's like smoking a cigarette. And I think I smoke cigarettes in that too. I had so much fun doing that show. And also that was one of those bad ones where like life sort of imitated art where we were always like, let's go party. Where I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, wow. But like I drank so much sparkling water. I think I had like three bottles of champagne with snorting vitamin D up my nose, smoking cigarettes. Like there is something about even when it's fake, the body's like, I don't know. This seems great. We do this all the time. We do this eight times a week. <laughs> so that that was what gave me the information to just be like somewhat of a mess for that whole show. Yeah. Did you ever have to pee like while you were on stage because you were consuming so much liquid while you were it's on like, stage? I know. I think I I think there was an intermission and I would always pee then. <laughs> Okay. But that I was able to figure it out. I do think actually like early on in rehearsals, I was like, I have to do one less bottle of champagne or else I'm not <laughs> going to be able to hold it for the whole first act. Okay, Celia, when you auditioned for musicals, what was your adult song and what was your kid song? When I auditioned as an adult, it was I Think I May Want to Remember Today by Richard Maltby and David Shire which is like from some review called Starting Here, Starting Now. It's a great up-tempo. Okay. And if you, if the audience could see their face. Like, we're taking it in. We're taking it in. We're going to link it in. We're going to link it in. <laughs> and then my kid audition song was When We Grow Up from Free to Be You and Me. <gasps> nice. Okay, Very that's nice. good. That's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, like all great New York actors, you appeared on the OG Law and Order and SVU, where you play former guest Samantha Mathis' little sister. In that episode of SVU, you have an emotional scene opposite NBC anchor, former NBC anchor Ann Curry, who is playing herself on a fictional news show called <laughs> Ann. On a scale of 1 to 10, how emotionally connected was Ann Curry playing herself? Nine, guys. <gasps> Nine. I believe yes, it. I believe Ann it. Curry. I believe it. I believe it. She, I... <clears throat> similarly was like, I'm about to do a scene with it. 
What are you talking? But you know what? It gave me a tiny window into. I was like, oh, there's a reason that she actually is like maybe an okay interviewer because she didn't have. I feel like sometimes in interviews where they're just like, I could be anywhere. My eyes <laughs> don't tell you a thing about where I am right now. I'm gonna keep asking the questions, but I'm not really with you. And it, when it finished, she was generous while we were talking, and then when it was done, she was like, that's very hard. What you just had to do. That was very very impressive. I was like, I'll take it, Anne Cray. Thanks. <laughs> She got a she got a raw deal. We love Ann Curry. Yes. Okay, Celia, top three theatrical performances of all time. Go. Helen McCrory in Uncle Vanya, The Bridge Project at BAM mm. in like two thousand one. Fun Home. Off Broadway. Oh, off Broadway or on Broadway? I can't decide. I'm just gonna say Fun Home. Mm-hmm. And wow, there's so m- many good things. Let's say Circle Mirror Transformation at Playwrights Horizons. We were just talking about it. We it's just in talked our about to- it. It's in our top as well. Yeah. Yeah. I went back to that show. I bet. I think honestly, five times. Mm-hmm. I would just bring new people. I was like, guys, have I got a show for you? I was just saying, I wish I could experience it for the first time again. You yeah. Know? So yeah. good. I was so obsessed with that show that I subsequently worked with three people, like my next three jobs. Tracy Chimo. Then Heidi Schreck, we did Betty's Summer Vacation together. And then Reed <gasps> Bernie, I did this play called A Small Fire with him. Mm. Okay, you famously sang On My Own as Eponine in the 2006 Broadway revival of Les Mis. Fuck, Mary kill these non-Broadway versions of On My Own. Leah Michelle's a la Glee, Katie Holmes a la Dawson's Creek, and Samantha Barks a la Les Mis movie. One you're going to fuck, one you're going to marry, one you're going to kill. Who is the second one? Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. I got to kill Katie Holmes because I never heard that song sung by her. <laughs> We're going to send it to you. It's good. <laughs> um, I'm going to fuck Leah Michelle's and marry Samantha Barks. Okay. Love it. You Love know, it. I got to play that part because Leah Michelle did not. She had originally been cast and then what? she maybe got Glee, not Glee, but she had to drop out. And so they had to re-audition the whole thing. And that's how I got to do it. And oh she my God. called me afterwards. She was like, I have to say, like, I was so worried about who is going to take over. And I'm so happy it's you. And I was like, okay. Oh, Mine. that's nice. It's generous. Yeah. I think she did a ragtime with my brother. So we, they, we have history. Who is one New York actor? You can't name your family members. Who is one New York <laughs> actor you'll drop everything to see, even if you know the play or musical that they're in is going to be shitty? Didi O'Connell. <gasps> We're coming back to the Circle Mirror transformation. Yes, she's, she's like incredible. Next. Oh my God! Did you see her show at the Vineyard? That was that was lost. that the show with the lip syncing show yes. that I that it's is a regret. Oh my God! I did not see it. I did not see it, and it's a mistake. Is she is something else? She is something else. Okay, Celia, you appear in the upcoming HBO series The Gilded Age opposite theater luminaries like Christine Baranski, Cynthia Nixon, Katie Finneran, Donna Murphy, Kelly O'Hara, Deborah Monk, and Audra McDonald. Between you and these seven women alone, there are 17 Tonys. Who was your buddy on that set and who was most intimidating? Oh my gosh. You know, I'm in the downstairs of one of the homes, so I couldn't choose. So it was Doug Sills, Michael Cerverus, Jack Gilpin, Kelly Curran, and Aaron Willamy. And I feel like we were, I mean, we were pretty tight. It was the first time I've ever been on a television show. Like, I feel like I've only done guest stars on television shows. So you come in and you're like, I just don't want to ruin your day. So I'm going to say the lines not very well and be on my way. But I didn't make, <laughs> but I, I didn't ruin anything. I'm just not very good. And this was the first time where I was like, oh my God, we're like doing like, scenes. We're just being together, sitting around a table, looking at each other in the way that people actually look at each other that I, for whatever reason, have never really done on television. And then off stage, like that time, I think also because we were shooting during the pandemic, we were so hungry to be with people other than the people we had been with all year. And that thing about being an actor, which is, I think, honestly, like 79% of why I like being an actor, which is like in between takes or during the lunch break, like in a theater where you're like, so tell me about your life. 
tell me all the things about you. We like got to get in there and we would just like stand in our masks in these weird little plastic booths and talk to each other. So the downstairs of the Russell house, those were my main hangs. Most intimidating, you know, I fucking love Carrie Coon so much Mm -hmm. and she's the head of our house. So on the first day I was like, just be cool. Don't. And then immediately she couldn't, she's intimidating in how talented she is. And that's basically where it ends. Cause she's there to have, again, I like watched her and learned so much about how to be just a great leader on a set because she is so extraordinary. She's amazing. I also did have a long conversation with Donna Murphy at one point. Like we were just in like full crazy wigs, like high collars just talking and I was like if the 12 year old version of me knew that this was happening like I would have lost my mind I I saw passion like three times (laughs) in high school like I just those are the moments of being an actor especially a theater actor where you've just like worshipped people for so much of your life and then you're like sitting on set and having a conversation with them that I think is like a really amazing part of this job. Okay, final question here. Very important. You appeared in a reading of a musical version of The Brave Little Toaster as the titular character, and allegedly Carol Channing reprised her role from the sequel as the ceiling fan. Please tell us everything about that singular experience. I am also so interested about that experience because that experience is on my Wikipedia page, even though it never happened. What?! I False guys, I was like, was that even a thing? And am I like, did somebody else have that experience? And they were like, we thought that was Celia Kinnebulger. Or was someone just like, let me throw in. Because I've never heard of anybody else who performed in the Brave Little Toaster reading. That was an 11th hour edition. And Anne was like, I've read this page and I didn't see this before. And I found nothing else anywhere. And I was like, well, we need to ask about it. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did. Wikipedia. <laughs> We're going to ask every single Broadway actor that we have if they were in the Brave Little Toaster. We'll get to the bottom of it. <laughs> That's great. Celia keenan Bolger, this has been a total pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on this show. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. What a nice way to spend a Friday afternoon. I was a little bit embarrassed that we were on the record asking about the Brave Little Toaster musical, (laughs) which we both found from Wikipedia. And we were like, it was like we added it in as we were like approaching the like the five minutes before the Zoom. We were like, oh, my God, we got to ask about this. And when I was listening back in the edit, I was like, okay, let me get dig into this. And I cannot find any record of this reading, but I am committed to it because I one, I feel like there's truth that it happened. Mm -hmm. And I want to know who really you know who was really playing the toaster or whatever and i was really into the idea of carol channing being probably in her like 70s maybe 80s playing showing up to a reading showing up to a reading (laughs) as the fan as the ceiling fan also you know if we had done a little bit more fact checking this fact came to us right before we started recording (laughs) but here what is what i put in the show notes when i was completing the show notes earlier today from the Broadway World message boards in 2017. Bless you. The subject reads, Brave Little Toaster musical reading. Someone says, while browsing Celia Keenan Boulder's wiki page, I found this. She recently participated in a reading of the Brave Little Toaster the musical as the titular character. Others involved included Carol Channing reprising her role as a ceiling fan. I'm assuming this has got to be fake. If so, which one of you trolls <gasps> did this? If not, details, please. Oh, wow. Somebody is throwing down on the Broadway World message boards, and I appreciate the energy that people bring (laughs) to these message boards. Well, bless Celia for entertaining us and for humoring us. We appreciate you so much. Also, love Celia's speaking voice. Yeah, she has a stunning voice. Also, because she has a podcast, she had her own recording equipment, which is why the quality was a little bit extra beautiful on this particular episode. So thanks to Celia. Please go listen to that episode of Sunday Pancakes with Kelly O'Hara. The backstory is incredible, and it really is a nice use of the medium for sort of hashing out a friendship and the things that come up in this business. Can't recommend it highly enough. Please go see To Kill a Mockingbird. She is an incredible talent. And good God, if you haven't watched Diane... Go watch it right now. Put it in your queue. Put it in your Gmail draft. Whatever list you use, make sure that you're watching Diane. It's a great, great, great film. 
All right, folks, as you know, we've been doing this thing. It's a six degrees situation where we connect this week's guest to next week with a little bit of a blind item. And don't you worry, I had it configured and Damien said, no, I have a better one and I'm going to use it. So Damien, I'm passing the mic to you. Okay, so Celia Keenan-Bolger, CKB, stars in Diane with former guest of this show, Joyce Van Patten, JVP, who was in the original Broadway production of Neil Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs with another former guest of this show, Mandy Ingber. You know her. Of course, she's a Halloween icon. She starred in one of our favorite movies, Teen Witch, opposite the late, great Zelda Rubenstein actor, Halloween icon, also HIV activist. Zelda also starred in Poltergeist with next week's guest. Woo! Baby! It's a Halloween bonanza. Get on the Poltergeist wagon. If you haven't seen it, watch it. If you have seen it, watch it again. It is a perfect film. I really think it's perfect. And Damien's got the hots for Craig T. Nelson. Ooh, I sure do. He was sexy. <laughs> yeah, he was. I think he still got something. I do love Craig T. Nelson. I like I think I used to think he was annoying in Coach, but I loved him. I hated Coach. Yeah, it's the I worst don't know why. show. It was it's one the... of those shows that looked too grainy yeah. even on NBC in 1991. It was too grainy. It was too sports adjacent and also fuck that Dick Van Dyke wannabe brother. I'm, Jerry Van Dyke, his brother. He's a loser. I don't he's like. A loser. I don't he's like a loser. the Jerry Van Dyke. No, no one no, does. No, no. But I like Craig T. Nelson, The Family Stone. That's where he won me over because he's like a real alpha dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, I can't wait for next week's episode. Brush up on Poltergeist one and two, not three. <laughs> All right, you little Halloween baniculas. You know what time it is. It's time to leave us a review. I got Damien with <laughs> I got Damien with Vanicula. I was working for something there. I loved that book. It freaked me out. It was also sexy was, somehow. I'm not sure how. <laughs> it was always taken out at the library. So you were looking for it, it would be checked out. I mean, somebody always had Vanicula out. <laughs> It's such a cool book. Ricky Dicky Tembo and I love it. Those are hard and to Benicula, find. And Benicula, they were always so hot. Oh god, I might have to read Benicula <laughs> just in time for Halloween, folks. We <laughs> have put together next week's episode just in time for Halloween. So really, get on the bandwagon with us. If you're reading Benicula this week, please DM me. Don't do that and not let me know. You know what time it is, Baniculas. It's time for you to leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. If you've done it already, get somebody else to do it. Get their phone. Put a little dippity doppity do into that iTunes review. It's the thing that helps us out the most. It pushes us to the top of the algorithm and gets us in front of other people's eyes and ears. And that's how we continue to do what we're doing and grow this podcast for you, dear listeners. We love you. We appreciate you. And the Apple review helps us the most. Folks, if you like this type of content, if you want more Benicula, craft, <laughs> Teen Witch, Poltergeist, us tweeting at Rita Wilson, asking her if she was in Teen Witch because the IMDb says so, then you need to follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at Damian Bellino. It's Damian with an A. Damian Bellino. And you can find my cohort over here at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. know her from is produced by us damien banicula bellino and ann banicula <laughs> rodeman yeah i don't know what i was doing there it's us we are the people that put this together it's our blood sweat and tears so thank you for being on board and we want to put a special thanks to grumpy entertainment they are our consultants that keep us high and dry and beautiful they are the heart and soul of this podcast and we want to thank jason jude hill and daniel sears and all the editing you hear courtesy of course of daniel sears Special thanks to Gang, who have music that is a little bit scary, and it could be appropriate for your Halloween party playlist. All the music that you hear under each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is by Gang. You can download and stream them wherever you listen to your music. And folks, you don't remember what the cover of Benicula looked like? Guess what? You can find it in the show notes. I'm putting it in there. Get down and dirty with us. Speaking of hot books from the children's library do you remember serendipity it was about like uh like a loch ness monster type oh no but i loved the loch ness monster i do anything to get any any my hands on anything related to the loch ness monster do you ever think about rereading books that you liked as a kid like banicula or like i know it wasn't i like the apple cart kids or something it was like not it was like a i think it was like the it was probably like a generic brand that my parents bought me of like the box cart yeah and it was like apple cart yeah yeah <laughs> I was into it. I actually, I mean, I reread Charlotte's Web 
during the pandemic, I actually listened to E.B. White read it to me because it was the thing that I could get through. I had started like eight books and couldn't finish anything. And so I moved to audiobooks, which is not my usual medium. And I cannot recommend Charlotte's Web highly enough. I sobbed uncontrollably and laughed out loud. It is a excellent book. Do I think Benicula is in that territory? Let's say yes. Let's say We're yes. We're going to book club Benicula. I'm going to read it this week and find out. Was it written by a woman? I, I don't know. It seems too Fingers demonic. Crossed. A woman and a man. Double authors. Wow, this is wild. I'm into okay. it as long as they're not married couple, because then I'll believe that one of them is I gay. I hate that. I hate that. Co-authored by his late <gasps> wife, Deborah. Never mind, Bonicula has been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Too many men involved. 